so glad you could join me. Today, I thought we could take a look at this fantastic book that I found recently. The outside is made to look like a storage crate with wood strips that are riveted together at the crossings and we have a little tag here and uh, some cotton ribbon tying it together and this is called the explorers botanical by Florence Thenard and photographs by Yannick Foreen. Imagine sweating in the desert alongside Theodore Menard, or walking the Chilean coast with Darwin, or getting lost in the Amazonian forest in the company of Humboldt. Follow in the footsteps of Marco Polo, on his journey to Asia and browse the Pacific like Bougainville. Welcome to Adventures in Botany. From ancient Egypt to the present day, Explorer's Botanical Notebook reveals portraits of the greatest travelers and their expeditions around the globe. Also on display are exceptional reproductions of the original botanical specimens. Through these documents, both precious and moving, jump into the footsteps of the greatest botanical explorers and share their taste for adventure. Let's take a look inside. This is a firefly. Books. This was printed in twenty sixteen. About the author Florence Thenard was born in nineteen sixty two. Francis Atlantic Coast. As a child, she exhibited a remarkable inability to do schoolwork anywhere near the ocean. The beaches, dunes, forests, ocean breezes, the ocean itself, and all of nature called to her instead. She labored through school and eventually earned her baccalaureate. When she moved to Paris, she finally found enthusiasm for studying and earned diplomas in history, political science, and international relations. Busy woman. After several years of observing the world through books, she decided to see it for herself and was a tour guide for groups in the United States, Turkey, Egypt, Thailand, and other places. When she returned to France, she became a print journalist, specializing in writing for youth and explaining the news. For a decade, she has written documentary books as a way of satisfying her increasing curiosity about history and the way the world works. To balance this demanding work, she also writes young adult novels, where reality and imagination intertwine. That way, she can set sail for distant horizons. And here is the author in her sailboat, handling, I'm guessing that's the rudder. And she has a v-necked white blouse and 
some jean shorts and her sunglasses up in her hair looking very relaxed there's a sailboat behind her as well this book was created in partnership with the Royal Botanic Gardens Q especially the Bear Collections. The Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew is one of the world's greatest botanical gardens. Over one and a half million people a year visit its famous glass houses, historic buildings, and beautiful displays of plants from around the globe. As well as being an extraordinary garden, Kew is a world leading scientific organization with extensive living collections, a herbarium, research laboratories, library, museum, art galleries, and the Millennium Seed Bank, which holds over 2 billion seeds in safe storage. This book was created in partnership with the University de Montpellier, too, especially the herbarium in the Paul Petri Malm Scientific the Scientific Heritage Center, and I'm probably going to have really terrible pronunciation of some of these things. Without fear of contradiction, we can say that any herbarium exists because of the explorers. It grows and continues growing thanks to harvests, exchanges, and observations by men and women from all times and places. They have explored backyard gardens, local streets, and mountains on the horizon, the end of the world, and the four corners of the earth. The material they brought back remains an incomparable scientific tool, a database and a resource to be explored, concentrated in a very small space, in a large world, a herbarium. And then we have some pictures of some of the folks here. We have Lydia White, John Harris, and David Goiter of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. And then we have Veronique Borgaud and Peter Schaefer, Paul Petrimont Scientifique at the MPU Herbarium. Voyages to Plants Unknown. being attacked. Here 
is a New Zealand warrior in full dress. The Europeans were armed with diplomacy, sabers, and rifles, which is the unfortunate way that they have a lot of things was with their rifles. The grass is greener in distant pastures. It is impossible to conceive the original floral wealth of this country. Ernest Wilson, China, Mother of Gardens. It talks about how Europe especially doesn't have a wide range of vegetation because of the glaciers. And once they receded, wherever the glaciers stopped, below that seemed to have more vegetation versus in Europe. And so when they would go to these foreign lands and see so much different vegetation than what they were used to, they were fascinated with it. Humboldt, a geographer, and Bombland, a botanist, at a rough campsite in the heart of the Amazon. So they're kind of giant trees here around them, hanging vegetations. What would Europe's gardens be like without them? Without the botanical explorers, the variety of plants in Europe would be much reduced and would lack color and perfume. Imagine the spring without camellias, tulips, hyacinths, mimosa, forsythia, or lilacs. Imagine summers without trumpet vines, hydrangeas, oleanders, or bougainvillea. No begonias or rhododendrons. Forget the fragrance of roses, gardenias, peonies, or jasmine. Erase the color of dahlias, poppies, or morning glories. Imagine the fall without the bright reds of Virginia creeper or maples. A park without birch or cedar. The streets without their plain trees or schoolyards without their horse chestnuts. Eat, heal, and grow rich. The quest for spices began it, from the days when the Romans in their journeys and their wars first acquired a taste for the hot or aromatic, the pungent or intoxicating dietetic adjuvants of the East. The Western world found it impossible to get on without a supply of Indian spices in cellar and storeroom. Stefan Zweig, Conqueror of the Seas, The Story of Magellan. And here we have a drawing of cocoa pods on a cacao tree. This plant native to the Americas has become indispensable. We have one of these in our local botanical garden. And so every time we're there, of course, we have to go see the tree with its cocoa pods on it. paper pack. 
there's a gentleman in front of what looks like crates that are almost shaped in the a small greenhouse type situation with the front open. I'm assuming maybe they'll close those with more slats like they did in the back. And then put all the plants inside. Wards watertight and airtight terrariums known as wardian cases revolutionize the transportation of live plants. Because if you would know from the shipwreck book that we covered, a lot of things were destroyed in shipwrecks and fires and all of those unexpected things. Here's a drawing of basalt prisms in a waterfall sketched by Humboldt. Naturalists were often scholars of all sciences, including botany, zoology, geography, and geology. I've never seen any basalt columns like this in person, but I think it would be fascinating to see them in their perfect shapes sticking out of the walls, the ground. And then for scale, you have three people over here and giant ends of the basalt coming out that they're standing on. So they're quite large. Discovery, wonder, and anger. The greatest pleasure for a naturalist, although more practical persons may not think so, is discovering new species, putting new islands on the map of nature, and sometimes even populating apparently empty continents. Richard Spruce, 1851. Yes, let's read about this a little. It can be disturbing to imagine white men crossing an ocean, getting off their boats, picking up a plant and declaring that they have discovered it, even though it has been known to the local population for hundreds of thousands of years. Generations of men and women had eaten it or used it as medicine, weapon, or dye. But such ancestral use is not dependent on a scientific description. By, quote, discovering, we mean, Recording the existence of a plant by sending its scientific description, a drawing or a specimen, to a place where they will be conserved and become a universal reference. Some naturalists make the point that their plant discoveries are, quote, new to science. Beyond the lure of novelty, botanists still revel in the beauty of the world. It's difficult to imagine the cultural and sensual shock when they first encountered the temperatures and landscapes on the far side of the world. Yes, I imagine it was quite fascinating. Here is Pierre Zonarat, a curious and attentive observer, makes a study of a parrot in New Guinea. Looks like you have the locals and they've got some large leaves. Fronds in the tree and a little parrot on a hanging frame for him to look at while he sits with a large board on his lap to take notes and drawings. Now we're getting into the section of portraits of the botanical explorers. And there's quite a list here of people from history that have contributed to the collection of plants. Myrrh and incense from the land of Bunt to the greater glory of Pharaoh Queen Hatshepsut. The first female Pharaoh and the fifth ruler in the 18th dynasty, Hatshepsut, from 1479 to 1458 BCE. Daughter of Thutmose I, she married her half-brother Thutmose II, 
who died young. His son, Thutmose III, came to the throne as a child. Hatshepsut named herself Pharaoh and was represented as a man with a beard. Her twenty-year reign was stable and prosperous for Upper and Lower Egypt. The two kingdoms bent to her will and served her, wrote the mayor of Thebes. Hatshepsut had her mortuary temple complex built at Deir el-Bahari in the Valley of the Kings. Her name was later erased from her tomb, probably by order of Thutmose the Third. That rotten child, huh? <laughs> when Hatshepsut died, Thutmose the Third took power, undertook a dozen military expeditions that made Egypt the center of a vast empire. On his return from a campaign in the Near East in the year twenty-five. He established a botanical garden of 275 exotic and extraordinary plants. Amun himself, the ruler of the gods, commanded that the marvelous products from the land of Punti be brought to him. Because he loves Queen Hatshepsut, even more than all the other kings who have ruled this country. Thus began one of the most fabled voyages in antiquity, recounted in the exceptional bas-reliefs of the temple at Deel Bahari in the Valley of the Kings of Thebes. That divine instruction came at an opportune time for the pharaoh Queen Hatshepsut, because border problems were interrupting the arrival of caravans from the Orient. The Egyptians needed supplies of myrrh and turpentine, two of the resins used in embalming, and in frankincense, the indispensable incense whose smoke carried the words of the gods. That ship set ordered the construction of five strong ships with white linen sails, propelled by thirty rowers, Counting sailors and soldiers, the expedition consisted of 1,000 men under the command of the Chancellor Nessi. They set off in the year 7 or 8, around 1465 BCE, for the land of Punt, land of the gods. The hieroglyphic record explains that these adventurers crossed a great body of water, the great green but the exact location of Bunt remains a mystery. Was it Somalia, Eritrea, Sudan, Yemen? Did they go up the Nile or down the Red Sea? The bas reliefs show the people of Bunt resembling Egyptians except for the beards and huts on stilts, surrounded by date and coconut palms, baboons, leopards, and a giraffe. Welcomed warmly, the Egyptians gave gifts, met the king and queen of Bunt, then loaded their ships very heavily with the marvels from the land of Bunt. All goodly fragrant woods of God's land, heaps of myrrh resin, with fresh myrrh trees, with ebony and pure ivory, with green gold of Iman, with incense eye cosmetic, with apes and dogs, Thirty-one incense trees of the genus Boswellia were transported in baskets filled with earth. The precision of the engraving makes it possible to recognize their massive trunks, their narrow oval leaves, and the small, irregular drops of resin exuded by the bark. The return to Thebes was a triumph. The incense trees were replanted in front of the temple at Deir el and other treasures offered to Amon and his priests, while the people sung the glories of divine Hatshepsut. Her majesty herself held out her arms and spread the incense all over her body. Its fragrance was like the perfume of the god. Its odor combined with that of bunt and her skin, now gilded like finest gold, shone as bright as the stars in the palace of festivals. Over here, we have little notes of the material that's in this photo. Pollen material from the 
specimen said to Peter Daly, Reading University, 1986, and all of the samples they have, twigs, pieces of branch, dried leaves of the different plants, and then you have different notes throughout. Here we have following Alexander's footsteps to an exotic harvest. Theophrastus, botanist of the Greek Empire. And it shows their journey. So they started in Bella and wandered around the Mediterranean to Alexandria and back over to Susa. Alexander III, king of Macedonia, led 30,000 foot soldiers and 5,000 mountain men to conquer the king of kings, Darius of Persia. Only 22 years old, he was beginning one of the greatest epics in the history of humanity. In 329 BCE, he conquered the provinces of Persia and Bactria, or modern-day Afghanistan, and in 327 BCE, he invaded India's Punjab, what might have been a simple military conquest, became an outstanding exploration of natural science, because of certain people among Alexander's companions, these included Aristobulus, the architect, Galisathenes, the historian, Androsethenes of Thaso, the biologist, and Nearchus and Onoscritus, naval officers. Theophrastus was known as a man of great intelligence, but since he was too old to go on the expedition, he asked them to describe every detail of these foreign lands and their flora and fauna. His collectors sent him letters and sometimes seeds and fruit. Back at Lyceum in Athens, Theophrastus compiled, experimented, and theorized, and classified their discoveries using a scientific method that would not be equaled for 1,500 years. His harvest of exotic plants reflected the outsized scope of the adventure. From Egypt came knowledge of the sycamore, acacia, date palm, and sensitive plant. From Libya came the jujube tree and the cypress. From Persia, the pistachio tree. From Babylon came seeds of the citron in 331 BCE. The first of the citrus fruits introduced into the Mediterranean basin. This golden apple tree was the biggest success for a millennium. India was the land of all novelties. Theophrastus was enthralled by the mangrove trees. The banyan tree whose open-air roots made a sort of tent where one can walk away for the hours. The banana tree with its ostrich feather leaves. He argued in favor of the economic potential of cotton, rice, and spice plants, such as cinnamon, cassia, balsam, spikenard, etc. Onescritus who had met Brahmins, also described the mango tree as a tall tree with wonderful large fruits, on which fed Indian wise men who wear no clothes. I'm sure that was scandalous to the Europeans. In 325 BCE, Alexander retreated and lost half his men in the terrible desert of Balakistan, while Nearchus was taking the imperial flotilla home across the Persian Gulf, with great difficulty. But on the shores of Arabia, the sailors made one last precious discovery, an ample provision of myrrh and incense, with which they filled their vessels before setting sail. The gardens of Babylon, the famous hanging gardens of Babylon created by Nebuchadnezzar in Iraq, a hot sunburnt land, was 
one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Alexander was overwhelmed and ordered that plants be transported there from Greece, especially those that provided dense shade. Toxic discoveries. Alexander's soldiers risked their lives testing unknown plants. Aristobulus warned against the tamarind tree, which has pods like beans, ten fingers long and full of honey. It is not easy to save someone who has eaten of it. We are some specimens of cotton. We have some that even have um, the roots attached. One with a bloom on it. And then here we have a more mature version with the larger leaves and larger cotton buds. Arabian botany in the time of the Crusades. Ibn al-Batar, the Andalusian in the Orient. In 1219, Ibn al-Batar, aged 21, left his native Andalusia to collect medicinal plants on the North African coast. His travels took him to the lands we know as Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt, and as he has traveled, he accumulated many plants and observations. For instance, he was the first to describe the Argon tree and methods of extracting and using its oil. When he arrived in Egypt, he found a country at war. Sultan al Kamil was trying valiantly to resist the Christian invaders who were besieging Damietta. The young botanist became friends with the Sultan and was appointed chief herbalist in Egypt. In 1221, Sultan al Kamil succeeded in negotiating the Crusaders' withdrawal by ceding Jerusalem to them. Taking power over Syria, his court settled in Damascus in 1227. Ibn al Batar undertook a new hunt for medical plants in Palestine, Asia Minor, and the Arabian Peninsula. A man of amazing intellect and a researcher with wide ranging interests. He was the first to discover a therapy for cancerous tumors, a herbal mixture called indiba, and the first to take an interest in weeds that were a problem for farming and classify them according to the crops harvested. He also studied the chemistry of rose water and orange blossom water, observed both marine and terrestrial fauna, and extracted essences from animals and metals. Ibn al-Batar spent the years 1240-48 to 48 in Damascus, writing his masterwork. Known in English as the Compendium on Simple Medicaments and Foods, or the Book of Medicinal and Nutritional Terms, or the Complete Book of Simple Medicaments and Nutritious Items. It contained all the pharmacological knowledge of his time referring to the work of 150 Muslim doctors and 20 Greek scientists. He described 300 new plants and reported on his observations in Andalusia, the Maghreb, and the Orient. He methodically classified 1,400 plants in alphabetical order, with their names in Berber, Arabic, Persian, Syrian, Latin, or Castilian whenever possible. He listed watermelon, cumin, which is good for digestion, and nigella sativa, or black seed, which he, wa which he said was, quote, a cure for every ailment but death. The mandrake, whose root roughly resembles the human form, provided a rare moment when he abandoned his scientific rigor. He said it was a remedy for epilepsy and for, quote, all the maladies caused by genies, demons, and Satan. Well, that sounds like quite the useful thing to have. <laughs> Although the great book was not translated into Latin until 
until 1758. It was used as a reference by Arab scholars all through the Middle Ages. The Arabs kept knowledge alive. While Europe suffered barbarian invasions and cultural pursuits were confined to monasteries and scriptoria, science and philosophy were flourishing in the Muslim world. Translations into Syrian and Arabic saved many Greek manuscripts from oblivion, including the thoughts and works of Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen. Thus, thanks to Ibn al-Bitar's commentary, Discords de Materia Medica, the work of that first century Greek doctor, a pharmacological compendium, including plant illustrations, can still be studied. Here is the trip. It looks like it started with Malaga and then around to Constantine, Tunis, down to Tripoli, around to Cairo, and then Damascus. Here we have this specimen from an argon tree was harvested in 1823 in a garden in Perpignan, France. So we just have this branch and there are thorns throughout with very small leaves. Boy, I bet that was fun to deal with when they first were trying to get oil from it. And then here's another packet wrapped in paper or linen of seeds. We'll take a look at one more. The Silk Road and its Spices, Marco Polo in the Court of Kublai Khan. Marco Polo was born in 1254 into a family of Phoenician merchants. His father, Niccolo, and his uncle, Mafio, had traveled to the court of the great Mongol ruler, Kublai Khan. When they returned, Marco's mother had died, and the young Marco was fifteen. He was seventeen when the three of them left for China in 1271. Marco became very useful to the great Khan and served as his special envoy. Late in with riches, the Polos returned to Venice in 1295, after a 24-year absence. During the constant battles between Genoa and Venice, Marco was taken prisoner and dictated his travel stories to his cellmate, a writer named Rusticello, creating the Book of the Marvels of the World, now known as The Travels of Marco Polo. After his release, Marco married and had a family, dying in Venice at the age of 70 in 1324. In the 13th century, Venice was the greatest merchant city in Europe. Its traders supplied luxurious goods from the Indies. Marco Polo's father and uncle, Niccolo and Mafio, had already traveled to China in 1253. Not without difficulty, they took the Silk Route, that went north of the Caspian Sea. The emperor of the Tatars, Kublai Khan, welcomed them warmly and even asked them to ask the Pope to send missionaries to him. But when they returned to Rome, a new Pope was about to be elected. The Polo brothers waited three years and decided to leave in 1271, this time taking Marco, who was 17, which I had read earlier that, uh, that was, at 15, was the first time his father had seen him because he left when his wife was pregnant with Marco. So by the time he got back, his wife had died and Marco was 15. The first stop was Acre, where the family had a business office. From there, to avoid the dangers of the roads and evil events of wars, they went on horses through Little Armenia, Anatolia, the land of Turks, they said they were ignorant and rude people. <laughs> Greater Armenia and Persia, and they said inhabitants are nat 
nasty, quarrelsome crooks, thieves, and assassins. I'm guessing they had some rough encounters. After walking for days, little water is to be met with, and that little is impregnated with salt, green as grass, and bitter they arrived at the Persian Gulf. Yes, I imagine they were bitter. Then their route took them north through Afghanistan, Kashmir, western China, and the terrible Gobi Desert, haunted by evil spirits. That part of the trip was done in winter, and the polos were often stopped by snow and floods. Happily, Kublai Khan, having heard of their return, sent more than 40,000 of his people to meet them. Well, that was quite the welcoming committee, wasn't it? While traveling, Marco Polo, true to his merchant upbringing, estimated the possibilities. Here there were gold and turquoises, there dates, pistachios, paradise apples, known as bananas, and elsewhere, pearls, golden cloth, silks, velvets, ivory, and other precious goods. The young traveler paid particular attention to spices. During the seventeen years he spent in the service of Kublai Khan, and then on his return through Indonesia, Ceylon, and India, he never stopped looking for the sources of spices. In China there was a root called rhubarb, and great quantities of ginger. In Tibet, much cinnamon and other fragrant spices. In Cochina, aloe wood and ebony forests. In Java, an abundance of pepper and nutmeg. The Book of the Marvels of the World is full of these descriptions that fascinated Marco Polo's contemporaries and, 200 years later, sent Christopher Columbus out onto the Atlantic Ocean. The Brazil of the Indies In Sumatra, Marco Polo found Brazil wood imported from Indies. Its red bark was used as a dye. Brazil is named for this wood because the Brazil wood of the Americas grew in abundance. The Emperor's Paper Money Marco Polo was sometimes accused of telling lies. Venetians could not believe in the money used by Emperor Kublai Khan, which is neither gold nor silver, but the fine inner bark of the mulberry tree, cut into pieces and embossed with the Emperor's seal. A copy of the Book of the Marvels of the World, with 265 paintings by the Master of the Mazarine, was prepared for the Duke of Burgundy around 1410 to 12. In this picture, pepper is being harvested in India. There are cloves in great abundance gathered from trees with small branches and white flowers that produce a fruit in which the cloves appear like the sea. Cinnamon Virum. This specimen of cinnamon was first collected in 1831 and was refurbished several times prior to 1974. We have branches with leaves and then the little flowering buds as well. of that, and then more notes from different years. Oh, maybe next time we'll pick up with Sailing West to the spices of Sabango. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed looking into this Explorer's Botanical Notebook. I think it's always interesting to read some of the sciences got their starts, and a lot of times it was simply 